Hello, everyone, and welcome to this conversation presented by White House Custom Color. Are you trying to mute me? No, it's just real loud. And I, can't I sold Amazon, but it was $25. <laughs> listening to listen, not listening to respond. Yes. Oh, thank you for that. We're rolling. We're We've rolling been rolling out. the whole time. I just roll. No. All right. Perfect. Well, here we go. (laughs) We're rolling. (laughs) Um, Good. Yeah. So I'm Nick Onkin. I'm a photographer primarily, but uh, uh, I probably see myself more now as like just an overall creative as like I've, as I've gone and endeavored into and dabbled into other mediums uh, over the last few years. Um, I started out as a graphic designer. That was my first career, my first, my first life. Mm-hmm. in seattle um <laughs> did that and i i uh you know i convinced a nonprofit client design client of mine to split the expenses on a trip to africa and build them a photo library when i had no clue what i was doing it was just dabbling in photography at that point um much to my surprise they said yes and i took them up on it and i went to zimbabwe uganda kenya and burundi and that actually completely shifted my perspective in two different ways the first way was just like the way that i see the world and, uh, you know, experiencing the world, the developing world for the first time is for me was just like a crazy experiment experience and immersion of a world that I did not know people living in mud huts with grass roofs and sweeping the mud off their sweeping the dirt off of their, their dirt floor yeah. kind of thing. But yet yeah. they were happy and they were joyful and there was just like life to them that, you know, you don't see in that kind of, you don't see that kind of poverty necessarily here. Um, and so for me, that was like a, an eye, eye opening experience. And it just kind of, A, it led me to uh, integrating that, that perspective into everything that I've done over the, since then, uh, which has led me to a lot of things, you know, um, cha- other charity work and, and working with celebrities and different things like that. Um, but the, it also opened my eyes to the, the idea of, you know, the, the thought of idea of becoming a photographer never thought that it was even, you know, this is back in 2003. So this is back before any of like the photography existed online. You know, there was no, nothing online that you could actually know that this was an actual career. Like I would, I didn't even know photography was a career at this point. (laughs) Uh, because it was so, it wasn't, it wasn't shown, right? Like there was no photographers didn't have websites back then. No, this was like, pre this is before they had portfolios that they were sending to ad agencies like physical portfolios sure. you would fedex to ad agencies and um so i got back and i was, you know somehow just stumbled upon um i got connected to this other photographer who shot weddings and S- seattle commercial stuff in seattle and a friend of mine connected me with him to do website updates for him as a designer. And then I, I cannot, I got connected with him and I just started pounding him questions about photography. And he was like, so he was so kind to answer all my ridiculous questions. Uh, what camera should I get for this? What should I do? All these questions. Eventually he invited me to come out and hang out with him as assistant on set just to see what it was like. And then, you know, a couple, another year, a little while later, his assistant left and then I kind of took over, but this is like, you know, doing what, like once a week here and there. Uh, kind of thing while I was, you know, just, I started building my portfolio and just shooting people, my friends and, and whatnot kind of on the side, building a portfolio. And, um, you know, that's kind of, that was kind of my induction into like learning that photography was a career, like mm-hmm. you could make money at it mm-hmm. and the, like the actual potentiality of it. I didn't, you know, I didn't even know about the commercial side of it too much. And then, you know, cause he was like doing, you know, just localized Seattle stuff. Um, But then when you get into the bigger advertising campaigns and things like that, you're flying all over the world. Right. You know, you're shooting for huge brands that are in print camp, print ads across every large, major, large magazine, all that kind of stuff. And so that kind of started, that's where I started to open my eyes to it. And then I decided that's what I wanted to do. And so I jumped in and like went full force and kind of, reverse engineered a little bit, talked to other photographers, basically try to recreate, started to try to recreate things that I was seeing and then building a portfolio. Um, and it just kind of like, you know, slowly grew from there. How do you, how do you do that? Like, it seems to me that there are a lot of people now, cause now photography is like a very known quantity in a, in a relative sense. Like you didn't even know it was a real thing 
back then, right? You didn't know that photography could be a viable career. At least it wasn't on your radar. And yeah. now that's not the case anymore. Do you think that someone that is interested in photography can just kind of excel the way that you did? And I mean, did you... Did you jump ahead like that because of your talent, of your work ethic, of circumstance? Like, what was involved in you going from where you were to now, and in, in in recent times, like being extremely successful, really well known, having a good following, able to go down these all all these different routes, talk to these famous people? Like, is that something that's you're you're saying to somebody these days? Well, yeah, you can just do this, this, and this to achieve this? Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think there's, there's ways now of doing it. It's a lot easier. Is it? Because, it, but it, then it's also a lot harder because it's so <laughs> saturated, but yet like you can, you know, like you see, I, I meet these kids who are shooting these celebrities that are like their yeah. personal photographers. I mean, basically yeah. because all they want to do, they'll shoot for free. They, don't, they live with their parents. They don't have to pay for right. like, rent, all these right. different things. And, right. you know, they don't have to charge. So then like, you know, that just kind of, that's a whole nother conversation about industry right. and all that stuff, you know, you know, that also is a different, Different world than commercial and editorial photography where it takes a lot there's there's a lot more other relationships and like you really still have to have a very unique editorial style and a, and, and a style in general like a very good signature to to your work um, for me that took years to build you know it also the technology and online now now there's like you know you can get a professional grade digital camera for 600 bucks right. you can go online and learn how to use that camera for free essentially nothing, like people right. are, yeah people are doing youtube videos that teach you everything about what you need to know and then if you have hustle you, you put those two together and you can like create so fast that you you have a fast learning curve uh that's the opportunity of today that's also producing a lot more good photographers right. good enough because clients are hiring just good enough now and not great because they need mm -hmm. to crank out so much more content mm -hmm. um so it's that in that respect it's not what it used to be because i mean you look at like Abercrombie and Fitch, they used to use Bruce Weber. Their campaigns were amazing. Yeah. Now they look like every other freaking lifestyle brand. You couldn't even tell. You couldn't pick it out of a crowd. Um, and how much of that is due to the fact that it's that much harder to innovate these days because of how much content is being produced at a, an insane rate? Like, I mean, how do you how do you stand out today? Um, great question. <laughs> <laughs> If that's, that's the secret, right? <laughs> I, w I wish I knew, you know, I don't, you know, I, I think that part of it is also now that, um, it's, it's, it's almost less due about standing about, but or less due to standing out and more about how you are to work with, you know, oh. cause if you're, if you're, if your work is at a certain baseline of good enough, yeah. And you're a great person to work with. People will probably choose that because, like, at this day and age, like, people are cranking out so much content. They have to do so many shoots for this. You know, you basically marketing companies have like one market, same marketing budget. They used to do one or two shoots. Now they have to do ten to fifteen shoots. Yeah. So where does that get pushed down to? All of us, as a photographer. So you know, if everybody's getting paid like a little bit of money, then people really want to work with people that are, you know, they're fun and they enjoy what they do and they love what they do and they like you know they 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 love creating and they love being there and they're like fun to work with and fun to collaborate with you know i think the personality of the photographer is so huge as well so uh, um, part of the secret or i i guess what i'm hearing you say is be reliable and don't be a, a pompous ass pretty much yeah <laughs> Where like you used to like the big photographers, you could get away with that. Um, and yeah. if you're in, like that top, top tier, like the Lee, Annie Leibovitz and yeah. Bruce Weber and all those people, like you s can still get away with it. But even all right. of those people are working for a quarter or half of what they used to make yep. back in the heyday. Yep. I mean, when I started, I was part of the first disruption of the industry when digital just started getting into play. Right. And they were just throwing money at photography. Like yeah. there was, I heard, I've heard that there was like cocaine budgets built into the production budget and Come things on. like that. 
<laughs> serious. You know, now you're lucky if you can get like a if they can get them some cheese for your if you can get them to pay for your economy seat to fly to the shoot. You know what I mean? Like that's that's what it's turned into. You're like, oh wait, you know, you like this other person who's local will do it, you know, for this price. So unless you can get here by yourself, right. you know, we're just gonna give it to the next guy. And that um, other person is like Janice from accounting's daughter who has a Canon Rebel that she got for her <laughs> 16th birthday. Pretty much. Sorry, pretty I'm, much. I'm, I'm I'm being a little jaded, a little facetious, but that's what <laughs> that's what comes to my mind. Um, you said okay, so you said something earlier that really piqued my interest. When you when you first kind of had this perspective shift, you know, you're in Africa, coming from the United States, um, two different worlds, really. Um, and I'm and I'm asking this or saying this because my wife and I have experienced some of the same stuff with uh, some of our photographic journeys here and there, where you see this insane level of poverty that you really hadn't experienced here in the States. But you said that, you know, they're, 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 they're wiping the, the dirt from their dirt floors and they're happy. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We experienced that same stuff in like the poorest parts of the world that we've been, where we have experienced these people super happy, content, like smiling, laughing, like that was their, that was almost their default attitude, it seemed. Mm -hmm. Do you think, sometimes do you think, and this is, this is me asking myself this too, do you think that they, they've got it figured out in a way that we don't? Um, you know, I think there's a number of factors in there and part of it's also just like accessibility awareness. You know, if you're not aware of something that you don't, you know, you don't have access to, you don't know that world. I don't know what it's like to be a billionaire and live that world. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, to go to and, the other uh, end of the spectrum. Sure. Yeah. You know, I think that's probably a big part of it is, you know, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to your own inner personal happiness. And, and even as it's like, you see all these movie stars like Jim Carrey or Brad Pitt, and they get to this space where they're like, eh, and then what, you know, hmm. you have all the money in the world, you have all the fame in the world. And then what, and it comes down to the space of like, you know, being happy with yourself and not being validated by external experiences. And that, you know, I think that trickles all the way down the chain to, you know, people that are sweeping their, their dirt floors and, you know, they're happy with where they're at. I mean, at least that's what I gathered, you know, maybe it's not the same for everyone, but well, um, sure. at the end of the day, we're all human and it's like our input of external uh, values and, and validations. And the more that we believe that we are our external validations, the more we need those external validations. You know, I mean, look at our, look at our president in chief right now, like his ego is so big that he like he needs so his ego needs to be fed because like that's how it's been and that's like how he feels good about himself like we all there's you know until we can learn how to separate external uh validation i mean social media is a whole nother thing as well people like real you know people committing suicide because right. they don't get enough likes on a photo right. and like that's that's the big trick right is like detoxing from that need of dopamine of validation mm and and feeling good on your own but that takes a lot of work you're not immune programmed. to that i'm assuming you're not immune to that is that a, is that a fair assumption oh that's huge you know uh i i went through i've gone through a whole lot of that and I, I had to go through a whole process of realizing that you know i wasn't who i was shooting and who's mm. shooting for who, who that makes me who i am because um, i went through a whole downward spiral a few years like years back um, when I started my business declined a little bit and I went through a whole dark, dark space. And I think the biggest thing I had to learn first was that I am not my photography career. Like you separated, like it was an identity issue. Um, well, the idea, uh, that, you know, I think it's the idea of not believing, uh, your ego, you know, your ego believes that you are, 
your external validation. So mm. external validation being like accolades, money, right. um, status, uh, who I'm shooting. You know, for me, my art, my creativity, my who I was shooting, what brands I was shooting. Like when I was shooting all these brands, I was on top of the world. I felt really good. And then when I when that stuff started to slow down. I didn't feel so good about myself. Right. And I was like, who am I without this? Uh -huh. And the thing is, is like, that doesn't even matter. Like those accolades don't even matter as, as far as like who you are as a person. And I had to go through that and learn that. And, um, you know, but I did a lot, you know, I went through an emotional intelligence leadership training for a few years and learned a lot about these different ideas and concepts and, and mental constructs. Um, and, and, kind of took myself through that process. So but, you felt yourself slipping, so to speak, into, I don't know, some sort of a, a crisis type state and you took action and you were intentional about it. Yeah. And how did, how did you come out of that? <laughs> I, I mean, like cause, I'm st <laughs> still working through that, but yeah. well, that's, and it's a process, right? But I mean, like I've, I've talked to a lot of different people and they get into these they go kind of into this downward spiral, right? Mm -hmm. And it's it is an identity. I, I I've experienced it f through the, their eyes as as an identity crisis. You know, like, oh, I used to be a big deal essentially, and now I'm you know the phone's not ringing anymore, or or you know there's all these young whippersnapper kids that are doing this that and the other, and I don't know how to do this, and I can't do that anymore. And and I've I've actually had more conversations about this than normal, I would say, in the past year. And it seems to me like it, it really requires some proactivity to not get bogged down by that. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly what it is. It is it's an identity crisis, right? And um, like your ego is your identity. And if you believe that that is, a, you know, who you are, then that's where you crash, right? Yeah, like when the right. phone doesn't ring, who am I? Right. You know, when, right. especially in the creative field and especially, you know, I'm sure you probably talked to other photographers who yeah. were like blazing. And then now everybody's like, what? It's like crickets. And then yes. you're like, well, who am I? Like, what is this? And, you know, for me, that's caused me, you know, to go down a spiral for sure. Right. Um, but I think doing, even for me, like a lot of, you know, personal development and self-help stuff has really helped. Um, help me create and understand the structure of how that even, you know, the association of your identity to who you are um, and be, you know, being able to separate that. Um, Cause when you separate that then, and you don't believe that if the phone's not ringing, you're not worth anything. Right. Right. Um, you know, you are worth, you are, you are enough regardless whether the phone rings or not. Yeah. And that takes work to actually believe that. Right. It does. That takes practice, that takes therapy, that takes personal development work, that takes, I don't know, plant medicine. I, don't, <laughs> I like plant medicine. However, <laughs> um, you know, there are so many different ways and like things that you can do to to navigate through it, especially now, uh, especially yeah. with all the, the online content and stuff like that. But I think it's becoming, a, you know, it's, it's becoming awakened or, or becoming aware of these things so right. that you're not so attached to that. Right. It's like when you're, it's like, I, I started saying this, it's like, um, play the game, play the game. Don't become the game. Hmm. And when you become the game, then you find your identity and your value, whether you're winning or losing. Hmm. If you're playing the game, you're just playing the game. You have no, your value doesn't depend on whether you're winning or winning or losing. You're just playing it. So right. if we're just playing the game of life then we're not actually being life. <laughs> right. Or do you think that going through that process has led you, I don't know, maybe to discover other creative outlets like your podcast and the different things that you're doing other than, or in addition to photography today, absolutely. as opposed to, you know, like what, what it was like 10 years ago. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you have to pivot, you have to reinvent, you have to do all these things. So it, it actually pushed me to explore these different mediums from mm -hmm. like making art, you know, to painting, painting murals and now, and then doing the podcast was a whole nother thing, uh, which I still photograph everyone that I interview. So that's kind of like a piece of the, where it ties in. Sure. And, you know, I enjoy those conversations. That's another art form to me. 
Right. Uh, I also make hats now as well. Uh, that's another I saw side that. business. <laughs> <laughs> I saw your Instagram hat account. Yeah. Yeah. And that just, I was making hats with a friend of mine at her hat factory here in New York, like years ago, like four yeah. or five years ago. And then she shut it down and, um, it just kind of, I still just enjoyed, enjoyed it as an art form and, you know, it's something on the side that I'm not going to be a full-time milliner ever, right. I don't think, but, um, I do enjoy it. It's a fun art project and people commission me to do it now. Sure. So I think for me, where I'm heading is just like getting as many tools in my tool belt. So in photography is like the biggest tool in my right. tool belt, but it's not the only one. Right. Um, and I think for me, I enjoy inspiring other people to be creative and to create their lives and, you know, to always be creating really. Talk to me, talk to me a little bit now, given all of that, your kind of your trajection, we've all kind of, we've all kind of experienced this uh, blip in the radar, so to speak, or this bump in the road the last couple months. What has that looked like for you, given, you know, photography or podcasting or even making hats? Like, how how have you been affected by this personally? What has it looked like? Uh, it's like a fire sale. I'm just like <laughs> blowing, blowing cash left and right. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much all the yeah i mean i all I the money you like, saved up is 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 depleting <laughs> pretty much i had like all these a bunch of jobs that like were all that were lined up and then covid happened and they all got either canceled or rescheduled for yeah who who, for who knows, knows when. when at this point yeah yeah right. and so i've been just i've had to cut any external any extra non-essential spending yeah and you know but my i still have a fair amount of overhead just like in this new york apartment and you know food yeah your and, bills don't go away yeah you know my gas bill just went up to like 250 bucks because i've been i've actually been home right <laughs> which right. is like insane it's usually like 20 bucks right um because right. <laughs> you're using gas <laughs> yeah exactly uh you know so I've just kind of been trying to stay creative, you know, going through the emotional ups and downs and, and doing a lot of the, uh, the rabbit hole research of what's really going on. So I can be aware of what's really going on and, uh, trying to understand that and be aware of that while not like pushing myself into a dark hole. But, um, you know, I haven't, I've been trying to figure out, I've been doing these FaceTime shoots for, for as a personal project with friends of mine. Yeah, uh, I saw I saw that, or I read a little piece about that. I thought, and how does that go logistically? Is it is it more just of a creative outlet, or is it something that you think you might incorporate even on the other side of this? Or, I mean, as of now, it's it's been a creative outlet. I started posting to do sessions with people. I you know I haven't gotten necessarily any bites quite yet, but I just yeah. started kind of pushing that the last couple of days. Um you know, apparently there's still people with money out there <laughs> <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I, you know, funny enough, I literally just got like four hat orders yesterday, yesterday and today. I don't know where they came from, but it's been like radio silence since cordless since COVID started. And then yeah. now it was like, Oh, like a couple of people at ordered hats and things like that. So I'm, I've got those to work on this week. Um, well, and, it's, who, maybe it's yeah. turning around. Yeah. You know, who knows? You know, I was doing like a self portrait quarantine project for a little bit and like doing some of that stuff. I'm redesigning my main website and, and kind of domains and all that stuff. Uh, so I've been working on that project. I mean, there's projects just coming at the yin yang. Like I have no shortage of, um, yeah, there's no downtime that right. I'm never bored. There's always <laughs> things to do. Always let me ask you, a, let me ask you a personal question. I'm just curious when you, th when you think, you know, back to the last few years, who is somebody that really stands out to you that was really great to work with as far as somebody relatively famous? Relatively famous. Um, relatively famous. Lil John was really cool. I shot him really? last year a couple of times, yeah. him and Tyga, but Tyga was like for five minutes. Yeah. Um, and I don't even, like, they didn't even use the images because like, I don't even think they released the song. <laughs> it's like the second one, I shot Justin Bieber and Cody Simpson one year. We did this huge shoot for this 
co like they wrote co-wrote this album together we did this huge shoot it was we we're like it was this tight deadline they let me shoot film and digital which was amazing so i yeah. brought like my my hasselblad 503 my contacts g2s and um you know we shot tons of stuff on this dope ass ranch and like they're like we need this stuff we're gonna release it on friday and then <laughs> pff, gone like they didn't even release the album so like literally they really have like they just decided not to release the album probably because of just like branding for Justin. But like, and then like I, the, I had that whole shoot that I can't see the light of day because they own them. Um, right, I, right, right. I never give away uh copyright, but that was sure. the only, you know, I kind of had to on that one, but right. they paid me a, a good chunk of change it, for that. It was one, worth so. it. <laughs> it was, it was, a, it was definitely worth it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, what you got a lot going on. You have a lot of different, I don't know, irons in the fire. It seems like where where are the best places for people to find you? I mean, the best place to follow is just at Nick Onkin because you can get to everything from there. My mm -hmm. websites, my other Instagram accounts. Um, you know, that's kind of more behind the scenes, me and my life. And then I have like a, just a photography account, which is photographs by Nick Onkin. And then the hats are Onkin hat. So yeah, I saw that. Yeah. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for doing this with me. Um, I, You're in New York? I'm in New York. BK. You're, you're in a very different world than I'm in right now. I'm in the middle of the flyover states where not much is going on and everyone's <laughs> itching to get back to work and lots of people are threatening anarchy and everything else around here. So <laughs> I can imagine. I, you look like you're in your office, though. I am. I'm in my office. I'm I'm safe in my compound <laughs> here, but man, it's just not you being, I've talked to a few people in New York and it's just a completely different world, a completely different mindset than what it is around here. How so? Uh, well, I know the, you know, the people in New York, there's a, well, for one thing, there's a lot, A, population density, B, the way that the virus hit you guys is not the same way that it hit here. I think we had I don't know, a handful of cases. I I know like two or three people that have had it. Yeah. You know, whereas everyone I talk to in New York, they know several people that have died. You know, it's like a completely different effect. Wow. Same virus, but, you know, the diff different circumstances have led to different manifestations, I guess. So, yeah. There's a lot of people here that never did any social distancing and that complain now if they have to wear a mask going into the store. Like it doesn't wow. even and it doesn't even enter their minds, and I know that it's not like that in the bigger metropolitan areas. You know, even two and a half hours north of us in Chicago, completely different story, completely wow. different mindset. Um, yeah, where are you guys at? Uh, right, right around Peoria, Illinois, Central Illinois. Oh no way! My my grandparents they all live in Colfax. Yeah, where's Colfax? Is that isn't that it's south even of me? I mean, it's, I think it's just east or west of Bloomington, like 30 minutes. Yeah. Well, I can't I'm, I'd have to look at a map. I don't know. It might be, <laughs> it might be east because I'm west of Bloomington 30 minutes. <laughs> okay. Then it's probably east. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's been it's there. somewhere out there. You've been there once. <laughs> yeah. I've been there many times. Oh, um, well, I, I appreciate your time. I didn't know. You know, we've we've reached out to a few different people just hoping that they would say yes, and you were one of the people that we just hoped would say yes. And <laughs> so when you did, it was a very pleasant surprise. Yeah, I mean, it's quarantine time, and <laughs> it's just like, you know, I'm trying to do as much as I can and, and be creative and, and jump on and do all the things. So thank you for I contributing. appreciate having me on. Yeah, man. Uh, have a good one. Stay safe and, and do what you got to do to get through the next few weeks or months or however long this thing lasts. Thanks, man. You too. All right. All right, brother. Hey, guys. Thanks for watching this conversation presented by White House Custom Color on YouTube. Be sure to check out our other content and click that subscribe button right there. Right. <laughs> right there. It's there somewhere. <laughs>